so uh, I think that, uh, you know, as a nutritional psychiatrist, which I hope will be a growing field, uh, I'm passionate about the care, the proper care and feeding of the human brain. And I'm convinced by the science, which I've been studying for more than 10 years now, that, um, that the way to do that uh, you know, is, is to help people change what they eat. And, and I'm convinced by the science that the way that people should eat, the brain prefers to eat, is to eat a pre-agricultural whole foods diet that includes animal protein and animal fat. And that if you have insulin resistance, high insulin levels, high blood sugar levels, you may benefit um, from a low carbohydrate or ketogenic version of that same diet. And there are many other modifications you can make, but those are my standard principles. Public health and public mental health in particular is a mess. And it's a mess because nutrition science is a mess. And it's uh, largely because of nutrition epidemiology, which is not science at all. And so, you know, of all the problems, this is, in my mind, the biggest one. The lion's share of studies that wind up in our guidelines and our headlines come from this type of a study. And I think a lot of you know this topic already. I just need to give a quick synopsis, which is these are not scientific experiments. Uh, epidemiologists do not change people's diet and see what happens. Instead, they give them food questionnaires and they ask them, you know, how often over an entire year have you eaten this many blueberries or this many slices of bread or this many cups of milk? And if you don't know or you can't remember, that's too bad because you're forced to quantify your answers. This, I think, is the biggest problem with these questionnaires. Uh, many problems, but this is the big one. You are forced to generate data out of thin air. If you can't remember, you must choose a number. How many times per week or month? So uh, you know, these wild guesses become the data that then form these, uh, they're used to make these hypothetical associations between specific foods and specific diseases. The unholy trinity, the US Dietary Guidelines, the WHO World Health Organization report on meat and cancer, and the Eat Lancet report that just came out this year. Um, so all of these uh, documents are biased against animal foods in general and red meat in particular. And as you go through chronologically, you'll see that, that it becomes more and more stringent, um, with the most extreme position being the Lancet Report, which doesn't just vilify red meat, um, uh, but all animal foods are off the menu, virtually off the menu with that plan. So, you know, most people, including most doctors and nutrition experts, present company excluded, don't even crack open these reports to read them. And I really can't blame them because they're, they're unreadable. They're virtually unreadable. They're really difficult. They're dense. They're convoluted. Uh, and they're very, very long. They're really not designed to educate. They're designed to obfuscate, as far as I can tell. So if you read all these, they're all by different groups. But they have a lot of things in common. They're all long and unwelcoming and difficult to read. They omit and misrepresent studies that challenge their recommendations. Their arguments are irrational, incomplete, internally inconsistent. I mean, if you try to read one of these things, your head may actually explode. Um, they're intended, they're written to in, with the purpose of an influencing global human behavior. And they use fear-mongering, particularly Eat Lancet, but all of them do to some extent, uh, preying on our fears of disease, death, and planetary destruction. And when people are afraid, logic shuts down. You just cannot argue logic with emotion. Emotion will win every time as a psychiatrist and a human being. I can tell you that's true. I started to wonder if these documents might have more in common with propaganda than with nutrition health education. So I did something I'd never done before, which was I started to learn about propaganda. I'd never, I, I mean, I've never thought much about this word. I think it's in, it's in, the, it's in the water now. But, uh, you know, and this is a classic text by uh, Jacques Ellul, who is a French philosopher. And he said that propaganda is a set of methods employed by an organized group that wants to bring about the active or passive participation in its actions of a mass of individuals psychologically unified through psychological manipulation. So, you know, unlike, and, and I, I read a lot about propaganda over the past month or so in preparation for this talk, and I kind of boil it down to this, that unlike the best forms of communication, uh, propaganda is not egalitarian, it's not educational or enlightening, it's not empowering. It's dictatorial, deceptive, and disempowering. And the language is not that of informed consent, but it's the language of misinformed coercion. 
So here are some of the hallmarks of propaganda gathered from various sources. And uh, all of these uh, apply to the documents we're about to, to, talk, uh, to, to talk about to some extent. And with, in, in particular with the Lancet, I think every single one of them does. So we're going to talk about these, uh, these uh, keep these elements in mind as we're going through the documents, particularly things like you know, attaching your agenda to popular ideas or myths and hiding your motives and using one-sided uh, black and white arguments and, and overwhelming people with so much information and then, and then boiling it down to a simplistic message. Um, lots of different, different features here to think about. Then, in January of this year, this happened. Uh, the Lancet, a very prestigious scientific journal, published this 47-page report entitled Food in the Anthropocene. Its lead author is Harvard uh, professor Walter Willett, arguably the most influential nutrition researcher in the world and the father of um, nutrition epidemiology. <clears throat> so <clears throat> its vision is one of a great food transformation that can, uh, is intended to feed a, gl a growing global population in a sustainable way. Its core recommendation is to minimize or eliminate entirely all animal foods from everyone's diet on the planet and uh, to make us healthier, make the planet healthier. Uh, and so to give you a sense of how much red meat they uh, uh, recommend on average uh, in, their, in their diet, it's a quarter ounce per day. Um, and this is because they say that red meat is essentially an apocalypse on a plate, that it causes cancer, it causes heart disease, it causes obesity, it causes diabetes. Um, and every single reference that they use in the red meat section of their report um, is an epidemiological study or the WHO report on meat and cancer. Uh, EAT is a non this is their own description of themselves. They're a nonprofit dedicated to transforming our global <coughs> food system through sound science, impatient disruption, and novel partnerships. So they say that you know, eggs are nutritious, and they, they, and they say that this is, these are quotes from the report. They're a widely available source of high quality protein and other essential nutrients needed to support rapid growth. Um, in large prospective epi studies, um, high consumption of eggs up to one a day has not been associated with increased risk of heart disease, except in people with diabetes. However, in low income countries, replacing calories from a staple starchy food with an egg can substantially improve the nutritional quality of a child's diet and reduce stunting. So eggs are amazing, right? Um, so how many do they recommend we eat per day? We've used an intake of eggs about one and a half per week for the reference diet, but higher intake might be beneficial for low-income populations with poor dietary quality. So basically, they're nutritious, so eat sparingly. Now, now, I can understand if they might say, well, you know, maybe people with diabetes should eat them sparingly because we said that that's, that's where the risk lies. Well, except that this summary article of six randomized controlled trials, specifically in uh, people with diabetes, found that eggs did not cause any problems. Uh, so, and, and of course, this paper, which was published in 2017, two years before the Eat Lancet report, was not included in the Eat Lancet report. Um, so, you know, they don't like meat. They're conflicted about eggs. Um, <laughs> how do they feel about protein in general? Um, this is again, an un should be an uncontested area of science. Everybody agrees we need protein. We need all of the essential amino acids. So protein quality, they say, this is the quote, uh, defined by effect on growth rate reflects the amino acid composition of the food source. And animal sources of protein are of higher quality than most plant sources. I completely agree with that. High quality protein is particularly important for growth of infants and young children, and possibly in older people losing muscle mass in later life. So protein good, complete proteins excellent, complete proteins come primarily from animal foods. So that's fantastic. This is an argument for animal foods. Well, we can't have that. So however, a mix of amino acids that maximally stimulate cell replication and growth might not be optimal throughout most of adult life because it could cause cancer. I mean, this is unbelievable. And so I, you know, I really thought that I'd heard every meat causes cancer argument that there was, but I'd never heard complete proteins cause cancer. And so I looked to see what the, what the uh, citation was. There was a single source cited for this outrageous 
um, uh, uh, statement. It was this paper, which is on the, um, uh, which is about the gene uh, mutation theory of cancer. And in this paper, the words protein, amino acid, and meat occur a grand total of zero times. This paper is not about protein of any kind, meaty or otherwise, causing cancer. I mean, this is, I mean, they, I, I don't know why they chose, they, they don't have a leg to stand on. There is no paper out there, as far as I know, saying that complete protein, and, and if you're worried about complete proteins and you're warning people about them, shouldn't you also warn them about the sources of complete proteins that come from plants like tofu and, and quinoa? Um, and maybe people should be afraid to mix beans with rice. I mean, this is really scary. <laughs> So, uh, you know, it's just, it's absurd. It's absurd. So the message that you hear throughout the report is that, um, you know, that, uh, that a vegan diet is safe and appropriate for everyone over the age of two. Um, and uh, it's, it's but, but when you read the actual report, you'll find numerous caveats and exceptions and, oh, but not for these people and these people. I mean, they basically acknowledge in their report that, you know, um, that this diet, the diet that they're recommending, their reference diet, which includes a little bit of animal foods, that their reference diet is inadequate, nutritionally insufficient for pregnant women, for babies and growing children, for teenage girls, for aging adults, the malnourished and the impoverished. That's a lot of people. <laughs> and uh, and that, that everybody else has to supplement. So what they're saying is that their diet is nutritionally insufficient for human beings full stop. And, uh, but, you know, but lest you think you, know, you don't have to pay any attention to this, to this report, you can just eat as much meat as you want. Well, it's important for you to know that this uh, isn't just you know, another scientific paper. This is a master plan. This is a, seriously, it's a master plan for the human race. Um, so remember we said sound science, which you can decide for yourself if you think it's sound, impatient disruption and novel partnerships. So what, is they, what do they mean by impatient disruption? Quote, these are chilling comments. Data are sufficient and strong enough to warrant action, and delay will increase the likelihood of serious, even disastrous consequences. The scale of change to the food system is unlikely to be successful if left to the individual or the whim of consumer choice. By contrast, hard policy interventions, laws, fiscal measures, subsidies, penalties, trade reconfiguration, and other economic structural measures you know, need to be considered. I mean, this is, this is not just another nutrition study. These, these people have a lot of money, they have a lot of power, and they are getting a lot of media attention. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the founder and executive chair of EAT, Dr. Gunhild Sturdalen. We call it the world's most important lecture. Because getting it right on food is not only a prerequisite for achieving the Paris agreements and deliver on the UN Sustainable Development Goals. It might indeed be our greatest opportunity to improve the lives of people everywhere and help secure our common future on planet Earth. In fact, food can allow people to make a positive difference every time they sit down to eat. And if everyone is given the opportunity to make better choices, food suddenly becomes an extremely powerful tool for change. I contacted uh, Dr. Uh, Frank Mitloner, who's one of the people I consulted with, and he had wondered how they had come up with those projections. So he contacted them, he wrote to them and said, um, how did you come to those, to those calculations? Um, because his information, I guess, would lead us to a different conclusion. And this is the extraordinary reply that he got from the science director of Eat Lancet. The meat consumption limits proposed by the commission were not set due to environmental considerations, but were solely in light of health recommendations. This is not the diet to reduce climate change, but the diet to reduce the risk of premature mortality due to dietary related health causes. So, um, you know, this, is, uh, this makes me wonder 
uh, you know, if the Eat Lancet diet is not about health, and in my opinion, based on what I read, it's not about health, and it's not about the planet, what might it be about? And uh, so remember that third leg of the stool was um, novel partnerships. So what do they mean by novel partnerships? Well, um, uh, in 2017, EAT launched uh, uh, an organization called Fresh, a global partnership of 33 corporations. So what kinds of corporate uh, corporate interests might be interested in supporting a plant-based diet. You know, people often assume that a, that a, a pro-meat agenda is tainted by profit motive, but what about pro-plant agendas? So two-thirds of the companies are companies that produce things like fertilizers, pesticides, processed foods, primarily processed grain products, and flavorings and additives. So make it that you, what you will, but this is clearly not a whole foods agenda. Um, so a number of us, so I, I'd written that, that article for uh, Psychology Today, um, Eat, uh, Eat Lancet's Plant-Based Planet, 10 Things You Need to Know. And then a, a number of other people in, in the uh, sort of alternative nutrition community also wrote um, some, some powerful public replies as well. And, and they got some real traction on social media, you know, these, these criticisms that we're posting. And uh, apparently this ruffled some feathers because just a couple of weeks ago, uh, The Lancet published an article uh, criticizing the criticism without criticizing its content, uh, just basically upset about it and basically wanting to, uh, to silence us, essentially. Um, so science, scientists and journals face serious challenges in a rapidly changing media landscape that is susceptible to the intentional dissemination of misleading content. Health communication campaigns are clearly susceptible to polarization, so-called content pollution, and disinformation. Scientists and scientific outlets, such as The Lancet, need to be continuously aware of and act proactively um, to avoid manipulation and misinformation about issues of fundamental importance for human health and the planet. So again, they did not take issue with any of the substantive criticisms that any of us made. They were just upset that when you looked at the social media trends, there were a couple of, uh, a couple of Eat Lancet articles, and then there was my Psychology Today article, and then further down you see several articles by Nina Teicholz, and then you see one by you know, Dr. Zoe Harcom. And, I mean, they, they were just upset that their media message had been diluted. So this, this is a really, uh, it's just amazing that they would call it misinformation without calling us out on the content of the information we were we are publishing. So what would our, our dear friend and philosopher uh, Jacques Ellul have to say about this kind of a response? The propagandist must insist on the purity of his own intentions and at the same time hurl accusations at his enemy. The propagandist will not accuse the enemy of just any misdeed. He will accuse him of the very intention that he himself has and of trying to commit the very crime that he himself is about to commit. So, unscrupulous tactics aside, it matters if authorities get this science wrong. I consult with people all the time about all different kinds of diets, and one of the things that's been uh, uh, happening more often lately is parents consulting with me about their children, teenagers primarily, but some as young as six years old, refusing to eat animal foods of any kind. And they're getting these messages at school. And they're developing nutrient deficiencies. I have real clinical, real clinical stories about this. Developing nutrient deficiencies because no one is saying to them, vegan diets um, have important nutritional holes. They're just saying, plants good, animals bad. This is really dangerous, especially for developing children. I hope you will remember that we can save about 11 million lives a year. We can feel better, we can be healthier, leaving no one behind, while at the same time protecting the planet. It is possible, but, and it's a big but, it will require nothing less than a great transformation of the entire food system. Daddy, I don't want to eat animals anymore.